blaming Tone for the carnage and believing the suicide story wasn't the only way of taking down Woke Tone for the second time. Another way is to beatify his jailer, William Sandys. Saint Sandys. I think in part one, I proved beyond reasonable doubt that William Sandys murdered Wolf Tone and coerced Benjamin Lentain into disguising the wound and then covering it up afterwards. In my research, I found there was a strange campaign to rehabilitate William Sandys. In the Dictionary of Irish Biography, Patrick Long writes, Sandys William, militia and army officer, was a son of William Sandys of Crevamore, High Sheriff of County Longford. Almost nothing is known of his early life, but he had at least one sister. So far, so good, but also incomplete. Sandys actually had a brother whose name was Simon Sandys, who died at the Battle of Vinegar Hill in June 1798. I'm not criticising Patrick Long because I only found out about this after I put out the first show. Colm O'Rourke of the 1798 Rebellion Casualty Database let me know he'd found a Simon Sandys as one of the casualties of the Battle of Vinegar Hill. Sure enough, when I looked it up, I found in the National Archives a petition of a Maria Jackson to Earl Charles Whitworth, Lord Lieutenant Dublin Castle, alleging impoverished circumstances and requesting government relief. She referred to the loyalty of her brother William Sandys, who distinguished himself considerably in the rebellions of 1798 and 1803, and a brother Simon Sandys, who was killed at Vinegar Hill when opposed to the rebels in 1798. What I'm saying here is we're constantly learning new things all the time. And I can totally understand why historians have to keep going back and revising things as new information comes to light. This bit of information is important though, because if William Sandys wasn't enough of a bollocks already, his brother was killed in the rebellion, so he had even more reason to hate Wolf Tone and want to do him in. That's not the part of the biographical entry that concerns me though. It's this. Sandys, like Trevor, has been portrayed by most nationalist commentators as a monster in human form, acting with impunity towards prisoners, adding psychological misery to physical cruelty through extortion of money and property for safe conduct or release. Yeah, true so far. Given the confused weave of propaganda, distance in time, and genuinely barbaric acts committed on all sides in the revolutionary environment of late 18th century Ireland, these views remain suspect. Suspect? Okay, there were barbaric acts committed on both sides. I've done the pie chart. 1% of the barbaric acts was done by the rebels, 99% by government forces. Again, this retrospective balance doesn't reflect the reality of the time. Then we have this. Perhaps Sandy's only recorded act of decency from a nationalist source concerns his kindness in November 1798 to the captured Wolf Tone, noted by Tone himself in his final prison letter to his father. Well, I've explained this already. In order to get his money and his goods to the people he wanted to get them to, uh, Tone had to be very nice to Sandy's and say terribly nice things in letters. Tone wanted to give £25 to his father and £25 to Matilda. In today's money, that's three grand each. He really wanted to get that three grand to Matilda and the kids who were going to be living by themselves in France. I tell Sandys he was a walking saint. It was Sandys too who, when prevailed on by higher authority, surrendered Tone's body, uniform and sword to his friends. Are we meant to love Sandys for this? Because Cornwallis said, hey, you know that stuff you're kind of keeping for your collection? Will you, will you give it to the poor guy's father? No brownie point to me. It's not exactly Mother Teresa. Then again, neither was Mother Teresa. The Sandys love continues in another article that came out in 2013 in History Ireland. Wolf Tone and the Culture of Suicide in 18th Century Ireland. In this article, Georgina Larragui sets out to prove Wolf Tone killed himself. It opens with, It is now widely accepted that Theobald Wolf Tone probably took his own life. Not that widely. She goes through the usual stuff, the Reverend Jackson affair, uh, the suicide of Cato, of Seneca, and all the rest. But then she gets to a part of the article which I have to call into question. At the time of his death, suicide was a mortal sin, condemned by both Catholic and Protestant churches and a crime under common law. It was punishable by burial at the crossroads with a stake to the heart and the confiscation of one's goods and chattels. 
Given the legal and religious prescriptions against suicide, we must ask why Tone's reputation amongst his peers was not damaged. His contemporaries agreed that he committed suicide, yet he was buried in consecrated ground at Bowdenstown Cemetery in the family plot. Again, this would make you doubt he committed suicide. According to a London newspaper, The Courier, Major Sandys, who was in charge of Tone's trial, was not gratified by seeing a stake driven through the body of the deceased. Viceroy Cornwallis agreed. He did not delight in trampling on the ashes of the dead. OK, so Sandys and Cornwallis agreed, well, you know, we shouldn't put the stake through the heart. Except, as I told you in the first show, Sandys did want to put the stake through Tone's heart. It was Cornwallis who told him not to. I know it's nerdy, but we have to go back to the source material and compare both sentences. In the original article, it says, Brigade Major Sandys claimed Tone stuff as his property by a sort of droit d'Aubain, but he has been disappointed nor has he been gratified by seeing a stake driven through the body of the deceased. The humane Cornwallis does not delight in trampling on the ashes of the dead. This is very different to he was not gratified by seeing a stake driven through the body. This is very different to what Larragie writes. By putting in Viceroy Cornwallis agreed and changing nor was he gratified to was not gratified, she changes the entire emphasis and meaning of the report. It's an easy mistake to make if you leave out the sentence before, but he has been disappointed, nor was he gratified. Then, of course, it can read as if Sandys was not gratified by seeing a stake through the heart. Unfortunately, whether it's a mistake or not, history's a little bit like time travel. You know, in sci-fi movies where they say, you know, when you go back in time, don't touch anything or you will change the course of human history. It's the same here, just by a slight change of emphasis and saying Viceroy Cornwallis agreed, Sandy's now once again turns from murdering swine to walking saint. The Culture of Suicide article led to the RT History show featuring Jordina Larragui talking about Tone's suicide. Unfortunately, that's the only show about Wolf Tone you can find on the National Broadcaster. Look it up. No podcasts. Luckily, there is one other podcast about Wolf Tone on News Talk, where the editor of History Ireland, Tommy Graham, makes the far more reasonable assertion that Wolf Tone died of a cut throat.